It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Ernest Orfanos DDS all the way from Boca Raton, Florida. He is a board certified periodontist who's been practicing in Boca Raton, Florida since 1994. He limits his practice to dental implants and procedures associated with dental implants, such as extractions and bone grafts. He attended Sunny SUNY, is it Sunny? S U N Y Stony Brook School of Dental Medicine. It's State University. SUNY University, and then pursued his periodontal especially in Boston and Tufts University, where he was exposed to some of the founding fathers of interdisciplinary care. It was there that Dr. Orfanis understood the true appreciation of dental team members to achieve the highest quality of care. Currently, he is a visiting lecturer for the postgraduate department of periodontics at Tufts. Dr. Orfanis currently lectures nationally and internationally on the all-on-four procedure and has an interesting approach to his technique which entails facial analysis and the reversal of facial aging. His passion is dentistry, and he has a love for creating presentations with some amazing graphics and telling facial morphing. When he's not practicing dentistry or working on graphics for his next presentation, he can be found traveling with his wife and son, who he shares every free moment with. So if someone asked you, who invented On4, would you say it was Palo Melo from Portugal? I'd probably say it was Paulo Malo from Portugal. Paulo Malo, so I pronounced it wrong. Correct. <laughs> Paulo Malo from Portugal. And, Correct. And, and, and what, what, what do you think of that? Tony? I mean, some people, um, obviously, this is dentistry and censored, so we don't, we don't want to talk about anything that anyone agrees with. We want to talk about everything that's controversial. Some people say all on four means none on three. What, you've obviously heard that before. What, what do you think of that uh, pushback? Well, I don't know if you're even familiar with a uh, trefoil that's coming out, which is basically all on three. So um, all on four, nothing on three is really highly inaccurate. Um, the, and it is a plethora of reasons that we can go into on why it's inaccurate. But by virtue of the fact of understanding the literature, we know that the um, longitudinal studies of all on four compared to all on six Immediate load, delayed loading has the same 10-year success rate. That's number one. Number two is if you do have a, fail, a failed implant, you can certainly put the implant in and you can weld to titanium. So you can, you don't have to create a new prosthesis. This is very simple uh, if that does happen. Number three is because you're reducing the bone and you're reducing this alveolar ridge, you're getting down into the better basal bone. So you have less remodeling. You have thicker, soft tissue. We can really go. It would take a, a full half hour to explain the benefits. Well, and why. I, I, I hope you make an online CE course for Dental Town someday. We've put up 450 courses. They've been viewed a million times. And I, it would be the biggest honor if you ever created an online CE course for Dental Town. It would be my pleasure. Really? Absolutely. So I can tell my townies that you're going to make an online CE course? Absolutely. I, I, I want... I, um, these podcasts are consumed by millennials. Um, guys your age and my age, we read textbooks and go to conventions. And the millennials are consuming podcasts. Um, when I look at the nine specialties that the American Dental Association uh, recognizes, um, your specialty has changed the most. And they're so confused when they see a three-rooted molar with periodontal disease. And they're thinking, should I do periodontal surgery? Should I rip out the tooth and do an implant. I think your specialty changed more in the last 30 years than the other eight specialties combined. Do you agree with that statement? I agree wholeheartedly with that statement. Um, not only did it change, it's become more all encompassing. You know, when to extract the tooth is a very, very challenging question to address. Now with the advent of um, LANAP surgery, um, that brings in a whole nother dynamic with respect to what we can do to save teeth. But we also have to know longitudinal studies. We just don't base it on our, our feeling, our opinions, our thoughts, our beliefs. It's really the literature, the peer review literature, what has been published prior to, to us and to when we encounter a clinical situation that dictates and governs our good clinical decision-making um, abilities. So, Try, try to help out. I mean, I mean, how, how old are you? I'm 50. 
Okay, I'm I'm 50, you're 50, I'm 54. Most of the people listening to this are under 30. They're uh, 20% are dental students, the other 80% are under 30, and they're they're sitting in a, a patient. Um, it, it's a maxillary first molar. It's got a, a furcation involvement. How is she supposed to wrap her mind around? Should I do the old school periodontal surgery, or should I cure this with titanium? Uh, that's a very you know, that's a that's not such a, a question so easily answered. And I think you have to defer um, such a clinical question to a um, seasoned expert. Really, this is for for a young clinician. It's very challenging. Um, and not just the old perio of yesteryear where we cut gums, but we also have current techniques. Um, as I said earlier, one of my partner limits his practice. We have an interesting periodontal practice. I don't treat perio anymore. My partner does. Uh, and the kind of results he's getting with the LANAP, one has to really defer to the experts of that, that field to really make the best clinical judgment for the patient. Uh, but there are other factors that come into play. Age of a patient. I mean, if I have a 25, 30-year-old patient, I'm going to do what it takes to try to keep that tooth there for as long as possible. So age of a patient is huge. What else are you thinking about when you're deciding whether to do periodontal surgery or LANAP versus extraction and placing an okay. implant? Right. Well, root morphology, root, root morphology, furcation involvement, or for the um, root trunk size. I'm also considering the uh, mobility and the opposing occlusion. So those are some critical factors that I look at when determining whether the patient needs titanium or conventional perio. So you're saying that all in four is, is moving towards all in three? No, it's not moving towards. There's an additional protocol, and it's not moving towards. It's already coming out, and it's been through a five-year rigorous protocol. Yes, and there you'll, there'll be a protocol whereby it's all on three, but the final definitive, and it's just for the lower arch, and the final definitive prosthesis is to be delivered the same day or the following day. It's unlike all on four where you're in provisionals for several months, and it's, and it's limited to the lower arch, and yes, it's coming out. So all on three delivered in the same day with the final restoration? Correct, and it's, um, and it's, it's basically a... It's basically a treatment option available at our disposal for those patients who cannot afford the luxury of uh, an all-on-four. So is, is uh, now who does the most all-on-fours? Is it clear choice? Uh, I, I couldn't answer that question. I wouldn't know. But I mean, is this something that they're going to start doing also? I mean, are they going to start doing all-on-threes? Well, from what I understand, clear choice is no longer using the Nobel product. And this is very proprietary, the parts. The, the parts are very proprietary. They're proprietary to Nobel. So I would imagine that clear choice, if they are going to use, uh, in, incorporate this into their, into their clinics, then they're going to have to use uh, Nobel products. So, you, so obviously then you like the Nobel uh, products. You're, you're not using others. Um, no, presently I'm not. Uh, probably for the past six, seven years, I've, been using Nobel exclusively. And, and why is that? I'm um, trying to help out these uh, young dentists. They're 25 years old. They're walking out of school and they're all saying the same thing. They're saying, we didn't place one dental implant in, in school. They, they say that from all 56 dental schools. And then they go to the ADA convention and there's like 175 different dental implant companies. So sure. you're, you're all, you're all with um, Noble BioCare. So explain why, and try to explain to a, pretend your daughter just graduated from dental school and she just asked, Dad, what implant system should I use? Okay. That's a very all-encompassing question that requires <laughs> a, a very thorough answer. So <clears throat> first and foremost, I would say that's a tried and true implant system. We know that it's been around for more than 50 years. Number two would be the tolerance of parts. It's not difficult in this day and age to have implants integrate into bone. That's very easy. What's not easy is the high tolerance and precision of parts to create a long, predictable prosthetic result. That's the challenge. Then 
And for my particular inclination to, to use Nobel is I want to use an implant with an excellent implant surface. I want to use an implant that has excellent primary stability because I do a lot of immediate loads. And I think um, there are very few exceptions when in the anterior aesthetic zone, I'm not doing immediate loads because the research shows you're going to preserve more of the ridge and more of the hard and soft tissue if you immediately load. Um, so I need great primary stability. I need great tolerance of prosthetic components. I need a variety of prosthetic components. I need um, platform switching in no uncertain terms. So these are just but a few criteria with the Nobel implant system that I'm afforded the luxury to deliver excellence on a regular basis. And last but not least is the support is excellent. So you you think the extra money paid for no biocare, which is the Mercedes Benz of dentistry, you, you think it has value? You, well, you, let me, you, let me, you would rather pay you would rather pay value added for Noble Biocare than say the low cost provider, which is out of Brazil, which is uh um what's the one out of Brazil that's owned by Strauman? I think it used to be called Neodent. It's Neodent. Uh, so right. so so you now now do you feel that the higher cost uh, no biocare is worth the premium because you're in Boca Raton, Florida, and the United States has one million attorneys. And if you're ever uh, put on a lawsuit, Noble Biocare has five, 10, 20 year research on every decision they make versus some low cost implant out of uh, Russia. Well, my, my response to you is um, let's assume you were a family member, member needed a, um, heart valve replacement and you were going to have a uh, you know a, a heart valve replaced and do you want the best product or do you want the low cost product these are medical devices inserted into human beings and those human beings happen to be my patients and i take very good pride in in my work so as far as i'm concerned i'm not saying you have to use nobel but i'm saying you should use a premium product whose research is there, whose product is tried and true, because if you want to build a good reputation and a good practice, minimizing problems and maximizing the result is always, is, is always the ultimate goal. So for my own personal benefit, if I needed um, some prosthetic part in my body, for one, I am 100% certain I want the best prosthetic part money can buy that's interesting most of everyone i know who has placed a thousand ten thousand twenty thousand implants says the exact same thing they want the very best they want the mercedes benz and they always go with no biocare because they say if i'm ever on the witness stand i want all the noble biocare's research telling proving everything i did i want to ask you another um this is dentistry uncensored we don't talk about anything that everyone agrees on we always talk about the controversy. So I want to I want to ask you the most controversial question. It seems that everyone who's placed a thousand implants or more just does it surgically, and everybody who's placed under a hundred implants or more wants a uh, uh, surgical guide. So my question to you is: Do you use a surgical guide? Do you think every implant should be placed with a surgical guide, or do you agree with the people who have placed ten thousand implants that says, "Dude, take off the training wheels. You're a surgeon. Um, if you're going to place an implant, you need to get a scalpel to bone. You need to look at what you have." Where, where do you sit on surgical guides? That's an that's an excellent question. Um, I think it pertains to the comfort level of the the clinician placing the implant. Um, let's not remember that surgical guides, as much as I like them, they're not foolproof. Um, there are inherent errors with surgical guides. And we talk, you know, rather liberally when it comes to dentistry, but very few people quote the literature. There's an article by a gentleman named Zhao, Z-H-A-O, I believe, out of China, and he found upwards of 10 degrees variation with surgical guides. Now, an edentulous surgical guide and a tooth-borne surgical guide are two completely different types of guides. Um, are you doing a full arch or are you doing a single tooth? Are you doing a posterior tooth or are you doing an anterior tooth where, where, critical, where placement is critical? So I am a fan of surgical guides 
when the clinician is uncertain of, of him or herself. I'm a fan of surgical guides in the aesthetic zone where placement is absolutely ideal, especially when uh, aesthetics are of utmost importance and we need the best uh, aesthetic results. So I'm for surgical guides. That's not to say that surgical guides do not come with some inherent problems, but uh, for the most part, I'm an advocate of surgical guides. I'm, I'm a big fan of yours. I, I, I think you're amazing. Another thing that you're a big advocate of is I, I, I think the easiest way to be a better is someone said to me, how can I be a better dentist? I always say, dude, you're a homo sapien. You need to see better. Um, right. Loops, uh, endodontists want um, uh, microscopes. Um, you just need to see better. You're, you're a big fan that a homo sapien uh, should see uh, better at 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, or 5.5, and that if a human can see more, they're better. Do you think magnification is directly related to being a higher quality dentist? There is a direct correlation with higher magnification and quality of care in no uncertain terms. The better the, the, better the visibility, the better the quality of care that can be rendered. Um, we in our office, I've had prior to these uh, omni-optic loops that I just did a beta test for, let me see if I can find them. They're oroscopic. Prior to these omni-optic loops, I've had about three sets of uh, three sets of loops, and uh, and we do muscle microsurgery, so we have some um, we have some microscopes in the office. And I have to tell you that the the optics on these particular loops are so fantastic because they're magnetically held; they're easily removed. So. These magnetic, these optics are removed, and you can replace them with varying magnifications, such that you can go from 2.5 to 3.5 to 4.5 to 5.5. And okay, here, okay, okay, but talk about that. When do you need to be at 2.5, 3.5, 4.5, and 5.5? I mean, what? that's an next. That's an excellent question. I like to do my examinations. Remember, the higher the magnification the narrower the depth of field, and typically the narrow, narrower the width of field. So width of field is also related to proximity to the eye. So the closer the lens is to your eye, the wider the width of field you have. But the higher the magnification, the depth of field gets narrower. So I like to do my initial examinations with the 2.5. It gives me a good view of the entire arch. I'm not a toothodontist. I don't look at uh, single teeth. I look at mouths and I assess mouths. So I like a 2.5 loop for evaluations. Um, for quadrant surgeries, I perhaps would go with a 3.5. Um, for a very single site-specific area, I would do a 4.5. And in the event I, I break a root tip off and I have to go and retrieve that root tip, I pop in the 5.5s and it just makes my life very easy. And it allows me the luxury that my microscope doesn't. Now, I'm in El Boca Raton. Most of my patients are elderly. They can't always lie flat back. And uh, I kind of sort of need that with the microscope. It's not that I couldn't work that way without the microscope. It's a little difficult, a little cumbersome. And with these loops, it, it basically allows me to have almost the effects of a microscope without being relied on, relying on a patient's fixed position. So what percent of those 80-year-old women used to live in New Jersey or New York in Boca Raton? 102%. <laughs> it's so funny because when New Yorkers uh, retire in Arizona, they always go to Scottsdale. They never go to Chandler, Mesa, Glendale. Uh, what, what, is it, what is it about Boca Raton and Scottsdale that New Yorkers feel at home about? Probably the mere fact there are other new, new Yorkers here. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a tribal deal. So how hard is it for you to switch from 2.5 to 3.5 to 4.5 to 5.5? I mean, I mean how how it, difficult is the logistics of that? So here is a 3.5. These are my 3.5 lenses. Okay. Let me see if you can see these. Can you see them? Yep. So I'm going to pop off the optics. Just it's magnetically held. Takes wow. less than a, takes less than a second to remove. And then there's a little groove, it slides in, 
and it's magnet magnetically in the 2.5 lens. So to change lenses out probably takes a second, two seconds at most per lens. That is really, really nice. You know, one, one of the um, racist uh, or uh, whatever you want to call it, I see is that I go into dental offices and the dentist is using scopes and he's bad mouthing the assistant for not cleaning off the excess cement or the hygienist for not finding that calculus, but the hygienist and the assistant are all naked eyes. I mean, I've always felt that anyone in the mouth, whether you're a doctor and all that and a bag of chips or the assistant, the hygienist, you should all wear magnification. I mean, what do you, what do you think about all the dentists listening to you today that use magnification, but their assistant and their hygienist do not? Howard, I couldn't agree with you more. We have, um, we have um, optics for our microscope. We have the assistant side op optics. Um, so the assistant's looking through the scope as we're working as well. So in no uncertain terms, do I agree with you? Our, hy our hygiene department, she wears loops. Um, and then our assistants, more often than not, do not wear loops because um, I basically do everything. I'm kind of a little bit of a control freak. But I agree with you. Loops are, are cheap enough nowadays whereby, and if you're using for assistance, you can do the pop-up so that it's a one-size-fits-all as opposed to through the lens. And uh, we have, we now have, I think we're almost to my fifth pair of loops. So um, pretty much everybody in the office, for the most part, wears loops. I, I couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, when I look at videos of like a, like a bypass or, or any other surgeries on YouTube, the, dental, the, the, the nurse assistants are always wearing magnification. Right. I mean, I mean, there, there was into it. Um, you mentioned something that's extremely controversial, and this is dentistry uncensored. Um, Lenap, I mean, that has got to be extremely controversial. And I, I want to say a shout out. There was a periodontist out of here um, 20 years ago that Alan Honigman, he was thrown under a bus. After 10 years, a couple of my favorite periodontists joined Lenap. And now after 20 years, it seems like it's about 50-50, but there's still a lot of controversy. I mean, I, I would say a lot of periodontists say no, and a lot of periodontists say yes. What, what are your thoughts on LENAP? Okay. My, I, I is that, see is that a controversial enough question for you? Yes, that's a great question. <laughs> My partner, Dr. Craig Hesheles, was the first periodontist to perform LENAP procedures in South Florida. He has over 10 years experience. He was the very first person to be performing LENAP. So I'm always at odds because we see some of the most amazing results. I mean, he should be on the podcast showing you um, unusual results. Eight, nine millimeters of vertical bone. Tell growth. him he's invited to come on the podcast. I wanna hear about this LENAP. We get a lot of questions on LENAP. He has a, he has a great presentation on LENAP. The people who poo-poo it, the periodontist or, or other um, healthcare providers in dentistry who poo-poo it, how can you poo-poo something if you've never done it? How can you poo-poo something if you have no formal training? So to me, it's kind of silly. So so are you pro LANAP? I'm very, yes. In my practice, I'm very pro LANAP. I will tell you that we no longer perform resective gum surgery, osseous surgery in our practice. We haven't done osseous resective pro surgery in approximately five years. We will do pre-prosthetic surgery, but when it, treating a true periodontitis lesion or disease entity, LANAP is the way to go for us. Okay, okay, but I'm I'm still gonna hold your feet to the fire. You're you're a periodontist. You are all that and a bag of chips. I mean, I called you to be on this show. You didn't call me. You are uh, uh, amazing, and you're talking to a lot of 25 year old dentists who just walked out of dental school, and they're looking at a patient with a maxillary molar with gum disease, and they're they don't know if they should do LANAP periodontal procedures from periodontal procedures back in the day. Versus just extracting it and, and, and doing an implant. And they have so many mixed signals because the oral surgeons are not treat periodontal disease. So they're just saying to this young girl, just extract it and place an implant. I mean, is it that 
black and white. How do you wrap your mind around doing old school periodontal procedures versus treating everything with a forcept? Right. Um, that's a great question. And, it, and only time and experience can give you that answer. And I would suggest to all the, all your um, young clinician viewers that they join a study club. They have to join a study club with seasoned veterans running that, that study club. And what they'll see is they'll be exposed to, um, hopefully they'll be exposed to great interdisciplinary care. They will have better decision-making skills. And I would suggest the way I hold my study clubs is I provide my, my study club members with literature that substantiates uh, the position of what it is that we're addressing. So a lot, a lot of people uh, are asking, um, they come out of school, they got $350,000 in student loans, and it seems like there's a lot of noise about so many technologies because there's so many incentives to sell a $100,000 laser, a $150,000 CAD CAM, a $100,000 CBCT. What technologies are you passionate about? And, and if, if your daughter just walked out of school, what technologies would you be saying, hey, honey, you need to look at this technology? Okay, well, let, that, that's very, that very broad based. First and foremost, good loops. Because if you can't see your dentistry, you can't do your dentistry. Um, so that's number one. Number two is I'm a big fan of 3D technology. We are on our third cone beam machine over the past 11 years. Um, it improves us as clinicians. It improves our diagnostic abilities. Um, oftentimes, an, a radiograph, an x-ray is suggestive of something. There's a, there's a haze around the tooth that's suggestive. So I'm a big fan of loops. I'm a big fan of 3D technology. I would say to a young clinician, stay away from, at this moment in time, uh, the intraoral scanners because they're only getting better. You know, there will be new intraoral scanners on the market that will be able to do full arch scanning, that will be able to capture soft tissue. So stay away from the scanners. Um, you know, the CAD CAM is very expensive, and I'd say that put that on the back burner for now. The goal right now for young clinicians is diagnostics and carrying out good, basic dental care. Um, and to put the brakes on and slow down, get some time in the driver's seat before they start investing in some expensive technology. So you say no to the scanners, no to CAD CAM, but yes to uh, loops and diagnostic. What, what other diagnostics other than loops are you talking about? Um, well, di geez, I, I mean, I would just, I would just from a, a clinical standpoint, um, as a periodontist, you know, loops, <laughs> loops and cone beam are essential. I can't tell you how many times I diagnose endodontic lesions that have never been picked up and the prevalence of missed MB2 canals. I know these young clinicians want to treat these maxillary first molars with endo because it's a um, lucrative procedure, and I understand that. But if you don't have loops, you don't have cone beam technology, you're going to miss those MB2 canals, which are present about 90% of the time. 90%, that's a pretty high number. So those are really the technologies. I mean, keep it simple. They're coming out with a lot of debt. The last thing they need to do is put some additional debt on their back. Um, diagnostics and and self and education via podcasts such as your fantastic um, Dental Town study clubs and read as much as you can until you establish a comfort level and then direct your career in the direction you'd like to have it go. What would you say? Probably 20% of the people you're talking to right now are still in dental school, and some of them are thinking, maybe I want to be a periodontist. What would you say to a junior in dental school who wanted to ask you, do you think that's a good idea to be a periodontist? Well, I love the profession. I eat, sleep, and breathe perio. I'm going to South America to lecture on Tuesday, so um, it's, it's a passion of mine. I, I, I think that when it comes to interdisciplinary care of the specialties, if you're interested in interdisciplinary care of the specialties, we are the most involved in interdisciplinary care. I, I work with some oral surgeons. I have very good friends of mine who are oral surgeons, but they put an implant in, they never see the patient again. They don't talk about hygiene and maintenance. They often don't talk about 
soft tissue procedures around them. Endodontists, they treat the tooth and that's it. That's the extent of their interdisciplinary care. So as a periodontist, um, it's very rewarding and exciting to, to work up these cases. I will tell you that an, I'm an unusual periodontist, Howard. I, um, I mount all my cases. I use Lucia jigs. I record the bites in Centric, and I mount every case uh, with a face bow on an articulator. And my referring doctors are, uh, you know, now they're spoiled, but they were mesmerized. So You, you are old school. I want to ask you the most controversial question in perio. Um, we know below the belt, after HIV and AIDS, the entire planet got religion on STDs. But you still see dental offices every day. You walk into any dental offices, and they're seeing grandma every three months for a perio recall. And they haven't seen grandpa in 10 years. And then he shows up for a toothache, and he's got gum disease. He's got a bombed-out molar. Um, and people still question whether this disease is communicable like gonorrhea or syphilis or chlamydia, can you really treat grandma for periodontal disease every three months if every night she's kissing grandpa when she goes to bed and grandpa's never been to the dentist and there's research that shows that a simple kiss can transmit 60 million um, organisms. What, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, I have to say, thank goodness my wife brushes her teeth three times a day. <laughs> um, no, you're absolutely right. What we're doing is we are fighting an uphill battle. In no uncertain terms are we fighting an uphill battle. Now, add insult to injury. What if those? What, what if that spouse has an ill-fitting prosthesis that's plaque retentive? I mean, you're just adding more insult to injury. So we are fighting. What we're trying to do is perhaps stave off the inevitable. Now, there are other factors that come into play when addressing this. Host immune response. Um, how, is, how is grandma's host immune response going to hold up um, over the course of time? So, of course, you know, it's multifactorial, but yes, you're absolutely right that, um, that one of the etiologic or cofactors in the disease entity can be your significant other. So it, it seems to me that you could just build every recall practice in America if you just went in there with, with certainty and you said, look, I can't treat you every three months for gum disease without seeing the person you're kissing and sharing breakfast utensils with. I, I, I need to see your husband or this isn't going to work. Would, would, would you say, could you say that with certainty to grandma? No, that's a utopian society. That's never going to happen. You know, we strive for excellence. We strive for perfection. But dentistry is a little bit of art, a little bit of science, um, a little bit of uh, materials, uh, technique. It, it, dentistry is so, it's such an unusual and yet beautiful profession. But we're, you know, sometimes we're only as good as the patients will allow us to be. And that is a shortcoming of our profession, not just periodontics. That's a shortcoming of our profession. And we just have to come to terms with it and accept it. I, I, yeah, it is definitely art and science because we know what we know and we know what we don't know, but we don't know the unknown unknowns. And, I'm, and you know, I read um, the first dentist ever was Pierre Pichard. I read his book from 200 years ago. It was crazy. And then I read the first uh, G.V. Black. I, I got on eBay and bought the first three books autographed and signed by G.V. Black. I paid like 10 grand for them. I read them and it's just like complete voodoo. So I know a hundred years from now, most everything we believe is going to look silly. I, I want to ask you another dentistry uncensored question. Um, it seems like 10% of the dentist refer all the crown lengthening procedures to periodontists. I mean, when I talk to periodontists, they say, okay, I'm in the zip code 85044, and these five dentists referred all the crown lengthening procedures, and then the other 90 dentists never referred one. So what, what does it say about crown lengthening if 10% of the dentists see it as, as absolutely a religion and 90% and do not? And first of all, do you agree with those numbers? Do you agree that 10% of the, of the general dentist refer 90% of the crown lengthening? 
I do. Not only do I agree, as you asked the other question, what do I think? I'll tell you this without even looking uh, at those clinical cases, because I see them in my practice. Those who refer the crown lengthening have the best prosthetic results when dealing with a good trained periodontist in no uncertain terms. Tissue contour, tissue response. Those who bury their margins and pack core, then take some electrosurge, will always have a low-grade inflammation, bleeding on probing. Um, I think it is one of the most underutilized procedures in all of periodontics. And I think it really becomes a mindset of we as a profession. We set these, these, you know, we set these boundaries that patients will not go for it or I won't get the crown if they have to go for surgery. We create these boundaries. But if you think about our own health, you know, if you have to go through a procedure to achieve ideal health or circumnavigate it, what's your mindset? Um, in no uncertain terms, the, the most successful clinicians I work with refer for crown lengthening. Why? Because they get the results back that they want. They get the, they, they get the, the soft tissue response. They have the architecture. They have the, um, the prosthetics that allows... Uh, a beautiful result. So I don't know what it says. I understand why why some of the clinicians don't refer. It's an issue of, you know, am I going to lose the patient? It's an issue of money, you know, money's and cents, money and cents, dollars and cents. Um, listen, I can't convince everybody. I uh, uh, It's not my intention to try to impose my belief system on the world. But I can tell you this, the finest clinicians in the world, many of whom I've worked with and many of whom I know, always refer out crown lengthenings. I know. I agree with you 100%. And I, I, I almost want to just say, keep ranting about it because 90% of everyone listening on this podcast never, they, they, they must not understand. I, I don't know if they don't understand crown lengthening. I, I don't know. So, some people, uh, and I'm very say this artist, but this is true. Some did say that crown lengthening is done by the crown, that if you place a crown, and the margins on the bone that the human body automatically does a crown lengthening procedure and the bone will um, remodel two millimeters from the margin and that that mother nature does crown lengthening by itself. What, what would you say to that guy? I think it's, I think that's a, it's an embarrassment of a statement. I mean, it's very embarrassing. <laughs> to think you that say it's an embarrassment of a statement, but I would ask you this. How many dentists believe that? You know, Howard, I, don't, I want to put my head in the sand because, <laughs> because what they don't understand is what crown lengthening truly is. What they don't understand is not just vertically reducing the bone and the soft tissue. It's also horizontally recontouring the tissue such that you have a nice scalloped contour. It, and, you know, talk about crown margins today. You know, how do you get a good crown margin if... You can't see it. How do you seal that crown margin if you don't have a great impression? And how do you remove the cement? So there are that that's just such a weak argument. And from a biological standpoint, it's so frighteningly wrong. I it's I just I'm just I just put my head in the sand because I don't want to be a, around that conversation at any so, moment. So, uh, so you're saying that uh, it, it's the same discussion that fluoride in the water is a communist plot. Right. It's, it's, um, pardon my Bronx vernacular. It's stupid. <laughs> I want to ask you a couple other, uh, um, questions. There's a big, you know, in, in your, and my lifetime, you know, when you and I got out of dental school, when we, when we, when we went to college, you already had Colgate, Crest, Listerine. I think the biggest brand built since you and I got out of dental school was Invisalign, but there's, but in your specialty, periodontics, there's a couple of big brands building fast. We already talked about Lenap, but there's another one called Pinhole Technique. Another one is Gumdrop Technique. Um, what, have you heard of the Pinhole Technique and the Gumdrop Technique? Have you heard of these brands? I'm, I'm familiar with the Pinhole. I'm not familiar with the Gumdrop Technique. Gum, gumdrop is uh, Delia Tuttle. I think she's from Romania. Uh, but yeah, you're right. The the uh, the pinhole technique is a, a Southern Cal dentist, and he's really marketing a lot about it. Have you have you evaluated that? What what are your thoughts? If someone asks you, what do you think of the pinhole technique by the Southern Cal periodontist? What would you say? 
you know, I read his poster presentation before anyone even knew what it was about six years ago in Boston at the, um, the uh, Nevin Symposium, the, um, in, the Quintessence Symposium in Boston about six years ago. And I thought it was very interesting. And it's, it's not a technique that a lot of periodontists haven't been already using. Um, you know, a tunnel technique, we've been doing a tunnel. He changed the position of the incision. He changed not so much the, tech, the surgical technique, but he uses those collagen strips. He has excellent instrumentation to not only elevate the tissue, but to wrap around and to proximally and sometimes elevate the papillas because sometimes papillas with recession get blunted. Um, I think that he, ha he is a master at marketing. I think the, the procedure certainly has some fantastic merits to it. I know uh, numerous colleagues of mine who employ the procedure on a frequent basis. Um, and I think that there's certainly a, a place in dentistry for the pinhole technique which basically is nothing more than a minimally invasive procedure. Again, we're saying with dentistry uncensored, we want to say with the controversial stuff, you're an amazing periodontist. You are all that and a bag of chips times three. Um, a lot of the young dentists that were working at these corporate dental chains, a lot of them are very stressed because they are told they have to place these, um, these, um, chips into periodontal pockets because they bill like $15 a chip. And some of these patients are coming in to have like nine or 10 pockets that are six millimeter. So you have to place 10 chips of minocycline or whatever. The question I want to ask you is as a periodontist, you believe, well, that's value. Placing an antibiotic in these pockets is value. Or do you see that as just an insurance scam or, or and some of the, and some of the particular questions are, well, if it's tetracycline, um, instead of placing a $15 chip in nine different pockets, I could write him a prescription for tetracycline and it only costs the patient $3. If right. they went to uh, Walmart or, or uh, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, CVS or Walgreens or something like that. What would you say to that kid working at a clinic? Okay. First of all, I'd say that he has to understand the science behind it. This is not just voodoo that we do in dentistry. Uh, Lauren Gollop out of um, New York, a uh, periodontist, did most of the research on tetracycline, doxycycline as an antifibrinolytic. So it, breaks, it prevents the fibrin from breaking down, breaks the, prevents the collagen from breaking down. That's the whole science behind it. So you're absolutely right. Do we put these chips? Do we inject some magic yellow powder under the gums? If you read the research, if you pick up the articles, there were great articles written by Richard Oringer. Um, Richard Oringer was trained out of Harvard. He did some fantastic studies. If you read it, you will see, um, I'm not going to name the product, but you will see the Name the product. Name the product. It's dentistry uncensored. Name it's, the product. It's that yellow powder that you squirt underneath the, uh, underneath the tissue. Which is what? It's the uh, yellow, the, it's a syringe. It's the um, minocycline spheres. It's the uh, Arrestin. Okay, Arrestin. The Arrestin, I'm sorry. Uh, you know, at 50, I, things start to escape my mind. <laughs> so you will see 0.2 millimeter improvement. Well, Howard, when's the last time with your fantastic microscopes and loops you were able to measure 0.2 millimeters? Not, not hardly. Right. So what they do is they take three pockets and let's say it's one pocket's two millimeters and the other two pockets are three millimeters. So it's two millimeters, three millimeters, three millimeters. So they take an average. So what's the average? 2.3. Well, that's not statistically significant enough. So then statistics, it becomes 2.33. And if it's not statistically significant enough, enough they'll make it 2.333. It's these are products that are, are, I'm not saying they do any harm. I'm just saying they really, if you read the studies, they really don't provide much of a service. So you would say that you don't need Arrestin? I would say that um, Arrestin doesn't exist in my practice based on the research. Okay, now I, now I want to ask you a dentistry uncensored question, which 
I don't trust you can answer because you are a dentist, so you're biased for dentistry. But I got to tell you that when I go to Lifetime Fitness and I work out with ENTs, I have... I have had three ENTs give me shit that I'm a dentist, I'm missing a tooth. I'm, first of all, when you look at the 100 million insurance claims, the huge spikes on anything are the four six-year molars. Three, 14, 19, 30, most likely to be treated with a root canal, crown, filling, MOD, extraction, whatever. And they tell me, dude, you have a second bicuspid behind it, in front of it, a second molar behind it. Do a damn three in your bridge. They see so many of these uh, sinus um, um, bone uh, implants, sinus lifts implants, and they go in there with a scope and they say there's candidiasis infection all over the root. They also say that they believe that probably 20% of all Americans who think they have allergies is because they have a leaking failed root canal into the sinus. And these people come in and they say, I have allergies. And they go in there with a scope and they see some root canal leaking bull crap into the sinus for 20 years. And they basically tell me, look, you're a dentist. You have, you have a second by cousin and second molar. Do a damn bridge. Stay out of my sinus. Now, I know you're a dentist, so you're from the religion of of odontology so you want to worship two structure and you say screw the sinus i mean we'll do a sinus lip pack it with cow bone staples whatever but do you think the three unit bridge is underutilized and that the ent's um i mean they all tell me that so many people with sinus infections have leaking failing root canals and bone you know uh, sinus lips and what, what, what is your religion of the sinus? Okay, religion of the sinus. Um, fantastic question. Fantastic question. The longitudinal study of a three unit bridge in the posterior and the longitudinal study of a single tooth implant in the posterior both show, they both show almost the same um, success rates, if you will. And what, uh, what, what is that in months or years? About 10 years. 10 years, um, okay. Years. So, there's a plethora of studies, so that's just a generalized statement. The problem we encounter, I've been a periodontist for 23 years. I've had three sinus post-op complications during sinus surgery, and the fault was my own. The fault was not getting an ENT clearance to check the drainage of the osteomedial complex. So what we're doing is, first, it's back to the diagnosis. If we do not have proper cone beam technology to understand what it is we're looking at, we shouldn't be messing with the sinus, number one. Number two is if we're messing with a sinus, we should get clearance from an ENT because the, just the trauma to a sinus is gonna cause inflammation. And that inflammation can block the osteomedial complex. So you need to make sure you have a patent osteomedial complex. If you do these things, your success rate for implants in the posterior will be through the roof. Now, on the flip side of the coin, am I opposed to three unit bridges? Well, I don't know, let's say, let's be more specific. Do any of those teeth have endodontics on them? Because if they do, your success rate drops precipitously. And my partner is a root canal specialist, he's an endodontist, he does everything under microscope, and he's absolutely fantastic. But I will tell you, the studies say, because what we do is not based on how I feel today, it's not based on how much money the patient has, it's not based on warm fuzzies, we are a medical science. Unfortunately, we have to include art into that medical science. So we're in a very challenging but very rewarding profession. So I would suggest to you that if there's endo on those teeth, on, a, on an abutment tooth, you might want to reconsider a three-unit bridge, but three-unit bridges are tried and true. Does it need crown lengthening? Does it need endo? Does it need post and core? How stable are those teeth? What's the age of the patient? So all those things come into play. There is a time and a place for an implant with a sinus procedure, and there's a time and a place for a three-unit bridge. You know, it's interesting. The elite doctors, whether you're talking Mayo Clinic or Cleveland Clinic, 
they're saying that when a male turns 50, they want a brain scan because most of the brain tumors that kill you in the 60s, they could remove at 50 with the, the size of a pea. They want a, um, a, a colonoscopy. Same thing. They say these little things that are so small can be clipped out of 50 that kill you at 60. But they're starting to say they want a CBCT of all molar root canals because so many of them are chronically infected, releasing so many bacteria into the bloodstream. And there's even a book called um, Beating the Heart Attack Gene, where these cardiovascular surgeons are saying that so many of these heart attacks are from failing root canals leaking these bacteria into the bloodstream. And these are the bacteria causing a significant portion of these heart attacks, which when you and I were in school, they said we're all related to stress and all this stuff. But so many of these heart attacks are in the middle of the night. I mean, grandpa's sleeping in bed and he's having a heart attack. And a lot of these cardiovascular surgeons are saying, yeah, he's had a, a root canal failing, leaking bacteria into the bloodstream for 20 years. What, what do you think about that? Do you, do you agree with that or do you think that's crazy? You know, I... <sighs> I'm an expert in what I'm an expert in, and I don't have the data, and I can't cite the literature for that. And if you have data and literature for me, Howard, nothing would make me happier than to read it. But what I can tell you is each and every day in my clinical practice, remember, it's limited to implants, extractions, and bone grafts. That's my practice. Each and every day, I probably take anywhere from three to 10 cone beam scans. Invariably, every day, Every day of my clinical practice, I see leaking, failed endodontics on teeth that were not referred to me to evaluate. Right. And my partner, the endodontist, will just take a quadrant scan, and I tell him he's doing the patient a disservice. I understand the ALARA rule, A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, when taking radi radi radiographs, as low as reasonably allowable. Um, for A-L-A-R-A, -A -A, ALARA yeah. rule? Yeah. And what, and what what is the Alara rule with radiation? The Alara rule in the world of radiation is a minimal exposure that will give you the best result. So my partner and I always argue the fact I'm telling him he needs to take a scan of upper and lower arches, even if he's told to look at tooth number five. And I say the reason being is, you know, if a patient goes to see a physician, they just don't, they you know, they don't just evaluate the sore throat. They'll do a, maybe they'll do a blood workup. They'll listen to your lungs. They'll look in your ears. They evaluate you as a patient. And we in dentistry, for some reason, are so caught up on these limited evaluations, we neglect the rest of the mouth. And with cone beam scans, we, I always, 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 I can't repeat this enough, on a daily basis, find failed, leaky, infected endodontics that have nothing to do with what I'm evaluating. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Do you almost think that um, a 50-year-old patient, uh, as they're entering the heart attack zone, that standard of care is that they should be, all their root canals should be evaluated by 3D? I, I really do. I, I really do. And if you think about the root canals of yesteryear, when we went to school, uh, Howard, we're similar in age, you know, I remember vividly one of my instructors, one of my endodontic instructors telling us that the prevalence of an MB2 canal is about 10 to 12 percent. <laughs> and now you ask any of the dots with 3D uh, cone beam scan technology and they'll say it's 80 to 90 percent. So I, I, I don't want to let you go. Um, um, uh, we're all, we, we only got four more minutes. You promised me an hour of your life. But if I asked you, what do you think? I mean, you're an expert master on all and four. What do you think is the dentistry uncensored questions on all and four? What, what do you think that the homies listening to you right now understand the least on all and four? What, what, what could you, what knowledge could you impart on all and four that you think they might not get? Okay, let's, well, there's a few things. All and four is not about teeth, at least my approach, which is a very unique approach. There is, my approach is about facial, facial analysis, restoring faces. If you go to my website, you will see um, some really amazing facial And what is your website? Center, num number four, centerforsmiles.com. Centerforsmiles.com. Yeah, and it's number four, numeric value four. And if you go to the images, the gallery, and you go to the all on four section, you will see that my all on four is not based on teeth. 
I diagnose from the face on in and not from the bone on out. I'll be lecturing at Nobel's annual symposium um, in August on my uh, facial approach, and it's very interesting. So, and where, 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 where is that lecture going to be? That uh, I believe this year it's in Miami. My, and your book or so, okay. By, you, by, by the way, you're, can I say one bad thing about your website? Sure. You have Facebook, Google, and YouTube, but you don't have Twitter. And I think the president of the United States would not be the president if he wasn't on Twitter. Um, I think you, you have to add a Twitter deal because when you make a post on Facebook, they will only send it out to a few of your followers because they're pushing out sponsored content, advertisements. But when you make a post on Twitter, it goes to all your people. And Trump has 30 million followers in a country of 300 million people. So when he gets up at 3 o'clock in the morning and makes a tweet, 10% of Americans read it. So you got to add Twitter. I thank you. Um, you know, I'm starting to feel like an old goat at 50, especially with technology. I have a... Um, I have a uh, not not so full time three day a week uh, IT guy who comes in and, and does some stuff for me. Um, but I you agree. Re you really have a lot of great articles on Center Numeral Four Smiles dot com. So it's Center Four Smiles and Four is not F O U R. It's Four Center Four Smiles dot com. You got a lot of great content that I hope all my homies uh, get on and read. But you got to add a Twitter. So that when you put these blogs in there, I mean, I've read some of your blogs uh, on Lanap. I've read some, uh, why should you choose um, implants? Uh, you, you got a lot of great stuff, but if you tweeted it out, it would be so much more powerful than uh, Facebooking it out. But anyway, continue. Sorry I interrupted you. So that's okay. So it's all on for is about faces. It's not about teeth. It's certainly about faces. So um, that's number one. Number two is, all on four, nothing on three is the biggest lie I've ever heard. I have um, probably in excess of about 500 arches that I've done. Wow, that's a so, lot. Yeah, it's a lot. So I would tell you that um, come talk to me if any of you, if anybody wants to email me, grill me, question me. I also have a training center where I train um, surgeons and dentists on, on the all on four approach. Um, that's a whole different website. But, um, you know, that all on four is probably one of the most mis misunderstood concepts. Um, and if you're not adequately trained, you're going to get yourself into trouble. And I, I want one last question. Um, we're, we're an hour. We went into overtime. You're so sweet and adorable that you would get up on a Sunday morning and uh, come on my show to talk to my homies. I really, really appreciate it. But <laughs> And Howard, then get dressed up at two to boot. And and you you're wearing a tie, and I'm wearing a shirt. I and and by the way, I would give anything. I would fly out to Boca Raton and bring you roses if you'd make an online C course. We put up 450 online C courses. They've been viewed over a million times. The the you you our age, we like to buy textbooks and go to lectures. But these millennials, man, if it's not on an iPhone, if they can't throw it up on their big screen at home, you know, if you have an iPhone, you go to Dental Town, you watch a C course. If you have the Apple TV, you throw it up on a 60 inch screen. So we can just reach so many more of these kids if we do digital online C like uh, University of Phoenix. But I, I want to say this let's say you just had a 25 year old, your own daughter, just walked out of dental school and she said, Dad, how could I be a more excellent dentist? What would you say to her? We just, this is a, uh, a, this is July 9th. We just had 6,000 kids walk out of school, and they're throwing all these noises that they should learn Invisalign, placing implants, sleep apnea, you know, all this all this stuff. And she's saying, Dad, I got $350,000 of student loans. They didn't teach me anything about Lanap. I didn't see one implant. I didn't do one Invisalign. I just want to be a great dentist like you. What would your commencement speech be to your own 25-year-old daughter? My commencement speech would be keep it simple for starters. Establish a solid foundation in basic dentistry. And then once you establish that, then venture off. Do not – what I see too many young dentists doing is reaching out and doing – they're learning sedation. They're learning Lanap. They're learning 
uh, Invisalign. They're learning implants. There's too much being thrown at them. Guys such as yourself, guys such as our, as us, we took 25 years to get to where we are. And it didn't come overnight. And we didn't have as much thrown at us coming out of school as these young clinicians. And I think it's a great time to be in dentistry. It's a fantastic time. These clinicians are exposed to probably some of the best times dentistry has to offer. But I would say go slow, be careful, get a good foundation in general dentistry. And then when you pick up your next technology, technique, whatever it is, master that before you move on one step at a time. We're um, 10 minutes into overtime. I know it's Sunday. I know you're traveling out of the country. Can I ask you two overtime questions? As long as you buy me a cup of coffee. <laughs> um, you, you have a lot of these young kids saying, do I need to be doing these oral DNA um, samples uh, where you take a saliva and you send it to a lab? I mean, can I really treat periodontal disease if I'm not doing these oral DNA uh, lab samples of showing what type of bacteria is in this patient's mouth? I would say that if you have a recalcitrant case, a case that's really hard to get under control, that would warrant an oral DNA exam. I say, by and large, conventional periodontics resolves most of the periodontal problems that the patient would present with. But um, yes, I would say that if you have an unusual case, um, a very aggressive case, a case that doesn't respond well to initial therapy, then yes, you have to pursue and investigate further. Okay, and, I, and this last question is not common at all in America, but this show is listened to all around the world. And in Asia and Africa and, and Latin America, we continually get the question saying, you have periodontal disease, I should treat this with an antibiotic. Um, what would you say to a dentist in Malaysia, Cambodia, Indonesia who's thinking what you need is a prescription for antibiotics to kill all these, all these uh, gram-negative anaerobes like P. gingivalis and I can treat this with a prescription? What would you say to that kid in Cambodia? Gee, you know, that's, a, that's probably the toughest question you asked me all day today. <laughs> You're absolutely right. I tell my own patients who say, hey, give me an antibiotic, I have an infection. And I tell them, you have to understand the source of the infection. And you cannot fix the infection unless you get rid of the source of the infection. And the source of the infection is the infected tooth. And I would tell them that there's bacteria adherent to the tooth. And until we get that bacteria off the tooth by a surgical procedure or by an extraction, we cannot fully address the infection. And I explain to them, I explain to each and every one of my New York patients, if they're walking down the street in New York City and they're admiring a high rise that's going up and they trip and fall and get a rusty nail in their finger, they do not go to the emergency room and ask for antibiotics. They go to the emergency room and ask to get that rusty nail removed. That rusty nail is your tooth. And it's not until you get rid of that ED, what's causing the infection, the etiologic agent, until you get rid of what's causing it, antibiotics will not be effective in the long run. Great answer. Can I ask you one last overtime question? Two cups of coffee. Two cups of coffee. So they walk out of school and their instructor said, these are the people you don't place implants on. And the first thing is smokers. Then they come out to Phoenix, Arizona. Well, who's the most likely person to, to lose all their teeth? Smoking, drinking. So everything they say that you shouldn't place an implant on is all of their real world patients showing up in Phoenix. I mean, you don't, I mean, periodontists don't lose all their teeth. Dentists don't lose all their teeth. They're right. smoking, drinking Irish drunks. What would you say? What would you say to this 25 year old lady who is, he sees this Irish drunk chain smoker and he needs an implant and everything in school said, no, you can't do that. And she's like, all my implant cases are Irish, Russian, drinking, smoking, drunks, and everything they told me in school was I can't do that. So my question exactly is, do you place implants in smoking Irish, Russian drunks who drink vodka in Phoenix? 
No, I only have cute little old Jewish ladies here in Boca Raton. <laughs> what do the Jewish ladies drink? Are they are they wine drinkers or what? Uh, what, do, what do Jewish ladies drink? Probably white wine spritzers. White wine spritzers. Well, here in Phoenix, it's Irish Russian vodka drunks chain smoking, and the little girls say, "Well, my teacher told me you can't place an implant in a smoker." What would you say to her about that? Um, Because that's real world. Real world is you don't get these ideal patients that need an implant. Real world is you get a bunch of flawed humans that smoke and drink and eat Cheetos and Doritos and Taco Bell that need implants. What would you tell her? I would tell her that not everybody responds just to smoking um, or the effect of smoking doesn't affect each patient the same. I'd say check the surrounding periodontia. Does it look like you know, if the entire dentition, if the entire mouth is failing, then maybe that's a case you want to pass on. But if the tooth, if you have a smoker and the patient has, you know, localized periodon- periodontitis or a fractured tooth or non-restorable carious lesion, then I would say assess the remaining teeth, assess the rest of the condition of the mouth. And if it's okay, then go ahead. You can also check what's called um, pack years. How, many, how much have you been smoking? How many packs for how many years? And um, that value can give you a gauge. I find that metabolic disorders are probably worse than smoking. Diabetes, alcoholics, most of my, my biggest um, post-op complications have always been on alcoholics. Um, so I would say, yes, you're right. They're going to come across smokers. They're going to come across diabetics. They're going to come across alcoholics. And Play it by ear. Also assess the patient. You know, does this patient look like it's a friend, uh, like he or she is friendly and willing to work with you? Or are they, or are they grumpy? Because if they're grumpy, they might come after you if something goes awry. And I would also say make sure your consents are thorough. Because the young pretty woman who brushes and flosses 10 times a day is not coming into your office for, uh, for an implant. You're absolutely right. It's these patients who've neglected themselves for the majority of cases who come in and need need care. So proceed with caution. Assess the remaining mouth, the, the other areas of the mouth to see how it responds to the insults the patient exposes them to, or the patient exposes themselves to, and uh, and get good consents. And what percent of these New York, New Jersey Jewish old ladies in Booker Town would you guess are probably alcoholics? <laughs> what would you, guess? Uh, you know probably a very small percentage but I, I, I vividly recall three cases that went horribly awry um, and the fault was mine because you know what you know what my patients tell me so I have patients that that work the alcohol um, deal at the the bar or the whatever but they tell me that when they read all the press about alcoholics, you know, it's always some guy getting a DUI or whatever, but they say that when they work in their business every morning, when they open up, they have a hundred clients and they're all senior citizens who are buying a gallon a day of vodka or gin or whatever. They tell me that they really believe there's a complete disconnect on what the public thinks is an alcoholic, a DUI, Versus what really is an alcoholic, and they they say that they they uh, they have no idea, but they think a very high percentage of retired senior citizens just sit home and drink all day, and then that patient shows up to your office and needs dental implants, and I I remember um, um always smelling their breath and thinking they had some kidney disorder because I could smell these ketones, and it took me like several years to realize these aren't ketones from a kidney dysfunction. These guys are all boozing all day. Right. And so one of my friends who sells the liquor at Walgreens, uh, who I've uh, known for 30 years, I mean, you go over to Walgreens, they, they open up at 6 a.m., and there's a hundred people outside their door, and none of them are under 65. Right. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is the real world that we live in, and these are realities. And I still think we don't have the statistics. I have a very good friend who owns a DUI center. And you would think, and it's a, uh, a DUI where they are able to get their, their driver's licenses back if they go through a DUI protocol. And uh, you would think that these are all young kids, and by and large, they're, you know, the class is not filled with all young people. 
Yeah, it, I have an, I have another friend uh, who's a dentist who's in this um, opiate treatment deal for uh, Vicodin and uh, Percodan abuse and all this kind of stuff. And he tells me that the entire class is bankers, lawyers, dentists, physicians. There's no one in the class who has a tattoo who you would think is a heroin addict. And, right. and, and, and it's amazing. So, yeah, so um, these complications are, uh, are more. But, hey, I want to tell you seriously, um, I can't believe you came on my show. I'm sure my homies loved it. Ernest, if you'd ever write an article for Dental Time Magazine, it, the magazine's mailed to 125,000 dentists, true, but there's 2 million dentists on Earth, and more than that are emailed the magazine. So you would be writing an article for 125,000 dentists, general dentists in the United States, but you would also be writing an article for about 150,000 dentists in 220 countries. And to get an online CE course, I would seriously fly to Boca Raton and bring you three cups of coffee because I know you're all that in a bag of chips. Well, Howard, I, I need to thank you. Uh, what you've done for the profession is immeasurable. Uh, I'm not sure if you even realize what you've done for the profession. And especially for these young clinicians who are overwhelmed. And you're, you're, you're a mentor to them. You're a father figure. You're an educator. Um, you're real. And you have been um, absolutely fantastic to, for the profession. And it would be my pleasure to write an article and also do a CE course for you. Nice. I would give anything if you did that. That'd be so amazing because if you're 30 and under, if you're born after 1980, you don't want to go to a bricks and mortar CDA convention, Chicago midwinter meet. You want to sit in your home and watch on the big screen. And so if you want to reach the next generation, you got to do digital online CE because they'll, they'll open it up on their dental time app and then throw it up on their 60 inch screen and uh, and drink wine and eat Cheetos. <laughs> what did you talk about all on four? But thank you so much. I can't believe on a Sunday morning I got you to uh, get up in a suit and tie and talk to me on a Sunday when you should have been out at the Waffle House having a uh, fun breakfast with your family. Right. Thank you so much well, for coming on you. the show. Thank you for um, for uh, selecting me and sharing my uh, little bit of knowledge uh, with respect to my specialty. And um, once again, thank you for what you do for the profession.